April 27, 1865. Enveloped in darkness, the proud steamboat Sultana makes her way steadily up the rain-swollen Mississippi River. She is laden with more than 2,300 Union soldiers returning home after the Civil War. Seven miles north of Memphis, the Sultana explodes, engulfing the vessel in smoke and flames. Her passengers and crew must now fight the raging Mississippi and each other for survival. As we go in search of history, we'll explore the tragedy that claimed more lives than the world's most famous shipwreck, Sultana, the Mississippi's Titanic. April 13th, 1865. Shouts and cheers of joy erupted throughout much of the nation upon hearing of Lee's surrender to General Grant at Appomattox. The Civil War, which had raged on for four years and claimed more than 600,000 lives, was finally over. 5,000 Union soldiers at Camp Fisk, outside Vicksburg, Mississippi, were particularly thrilled with the news. The celebrating soldiers at Camp Fisk were recent parolees from the hellish Confederate prison camps Cahaba and Andersonville, where some had been held as long as 23 months. The death rate in the prison camps was 10 times greater than the death rate on the battlefield. Sanitary conditions were virtually non-existent. The greatest problem was starvation. Some of these men went in weighing 170, 180 pounds, normal weight for that period. They came out weighing less than 100. German-born Adam Schneider was among the thousands of soldiers wasting away in a Confederate prison. His great-great-granddaughter, Civil War historian Pam Newhouse, knows his story well. It was a terrible hardship. The river overflowed its banks several times, the worst time being in March of 1864. Many of the men had to stand in knee-deep water or higher water for two to three days. Another soldier who survived the atrocities of prison camp was Private Chester Berry of the 20th Regiment Michigan Volunteer Infantry. In his memoirs, he recalled his joyous arrival once paroled to Camp Fisk. I never experienced a happier day in my life than I did when we marched under the old stars and stripes at the Big Black River Railroad Bridge. It seemed to us that the all-wise ruler had gotten up a bit of sunshine and a small breeze in order that we might see that glorious emblem of liberty proudly unfold itself and kiss the sunshine. Now that the war was over, the battered prisoners consoled each other with talk of their impending release and of the long-awaited homecoming shortly to follow. Since much of the nation's railroad system had been demolished by the war, the government was already making plans to send troops home via steamboats on the mighty Mississippi River. By the Civil War's end, the Mississippi bore little resemblance to the rich, colorful waterway idealized in the writings of Mark Twain. Four years of fighting had destroyed numerous dams and levees, allowing snowmelt and floodwaters to overflow banks and swallow farms, and in some cases, entire towns. Despite these disastrous conditions, trade and commerce continued unabated as countless steamboats alighted upon the swirling brown waters of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. These marvels of the Industrial Revolution often resembled wedding cakes with smokestacks. Due to their unique design, they could navigate waters as shallow as two feet deep while carrying tremendous cargo loads. In contrast to their romantic images, 
most Civil War era steamboats conformed to few safety regulations, and in many cases, were accidents waiting to happen. They built these things out of flimsy wood. They built them so they could be as light as possible, they could be as fast as possible, and as profitable as possible. And they used varnishes and different flammable materials to seal the decks. The government had passed some steamboat regulations, but when the war came along, both sides started requisitioning uh, the steamers to transport uh, troops and equipment. And the military suspended all the regulations on the grounds of military necessity. Among the many private steamboats requisitioned by the government to transport Union troops and supplies was the 260-foot sidewheeler Sultana. She had been constructed and launched on the Ohio River in Cincinnati in February of 1863, only one month before being pressed into wartime service. Expectations ran high for Sultana. She was equipped with extra spacious decks state-of-the-art tubular boilers, and could boast a passenger capacity of 376 persons. In her early weeks of operation, she didn't disappoint. One newspaper of the day sang her praises, saying she was another model of Cincinnati boat building that reflects credit on the builders and furnishers. It was a pretty boat. It had a lot of fretwork, and the interior of it was quite lovely. There were 70 staterooms for the first class passengers. And then there always were deck passengers, people who didn't pay for a stateroom and they just had standing room or sitting room or whatever. Even while in part-time government service, Sultana garnered a reputation as one of the fastest and most dependable steamboats on the waterways. In early 1864, Sultana was sold to a group of St. Louis businessmen, including 34-year-old J. Cass Mason, who was himself a riverboat captain. Mason was a hot dog. That's the easiest way to describe him. As far as maneuvering his steamers and being able to get them from point A to point B, he was very capable, and in the Mississippi that says a lot because it's such a dangerous river. But he pushed them. He prided himself on speed, not only meeting his schedules, perhaps, but even exceeding them, because the fast steamer got the cargo and got the passengers. Mason was also a man with financial problems, like many of the high-living riverboat pilots whose business had been hurt by the war. He's a northerner, all right, but he was transporting goods to the Confederacy at one point. So I guess maybe he was just not above transporting anything for the buck. During the summer and fall of 1864, Mason pushed Sultana to her limits, setting a new speed record on the Mississippi. The numerous hurried trips and the high steam pressure they required took a toll on the boat's tubular boilers. Their temperamental coolant tubes were continually clogged with Mississippi mud, prompting pressure to rise increasing the danger of an explosion. By April of 1865, the Civil War was winding down. Trade was uncommonly slow. Competition for business among steamboats was fierce. With little incoming capital, the debt-ridden Mason was forced to sell the majority of his interest in Sultana, leaving him a 1 16th minority owner. With the war now at an end, Captain J. Cass Mason believed his fortunes were about to change, with tens of thousands of federal troops and prisoners needing transportation to their homes in the north. It's rather lucrative for steamboats to transport military personnel. There is a contract that for transporting a soldier, you get $5 a head for an officer ten dollars a head. So it was a tremendous windfall and steamboats were arriving at Vicksburg with regularity hoping to get some of these men. On April 13th, 1865, as Sultana steamed away from the wharf at St. Louis heading south toward Vicksburg, her captain J. Cass Mason 
clung excitedly to hopes for a prosperous future. Some 500 miles to the south, the 5,000 Union soldiers being held at Camp Fisk were in high spirits as well. The war was over, and they eagerly awaited safe passage home to their families. April 14, 1865. Despite the prospect of imminent financial ruin, Captain J. Cass Mason, master and part owner of the steamboat Sultana, was elated to be heading downriver to Vicksburg, where he expected to make a small fortune transporting Union troops home. At his first stop en route to Vicksburg, Mason and his 80-man crew received heart-stopping news. President Abraham Lincoln had been shot and killed by John Wilkes Booth while attending a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. With much of the country's telegraph system destroyed by war, Sultana inherited the somber task of delivering news of the president's death to every town, city, and landing along the banks of the Mississippi. Several hundred miles south, paroled Union prisoners at Camp Fisk awaiting their release were yet unaware of their commander-in-chief's assassination. The camp was filled with dreamy talk of homecomings, as evidenced by the letter of Sergeant Thomas Hines. Dear friends at home, once more I will take this opportunity to write to you a few lines of my birthday. I am 27 today. We've had glorious news of late. There is talk of our being sent north soon. I hope it may be so. I have not got time to write more now, so goodbye for this time. From your son and brother, Thomas J. Hines. Sultana steamed into Vicksburg on the evening of April 17th. There, Captain Mason met with Colonel Reuben B. Hatch, chief quartermaster of the Department of the Mississippi. Hatch was Mr. Corruption. He was in charge of arranging transportation, but he would not do anything without being paid off. The Army Command had initiated court-martial proceedings against him before, but the problem was his brother and various friends had been instrumental in Lincoln's election. So Hatch's political protection extended all the way to the White House. So he was covered. Like J. Cass Basin, Hatch saw a huge potential for profit in the transporting of freed POWs home. After conferring with Mason, it was agreed that Hatch would receive a commission to place a large load of Camp Fisk soldiers aboard the Sultana. And his idea of a large load was 1,500 men, which would have been a pretty good size load bigger than most loads, and Hatch was willing to give it to him, it looks like. But the capacity of that boat was 376. On April 23rd, Captain Mason's dreams of fortune seemed doubtful when one of Sultana's aging boilers ruptured. Motivated by greed, Sultana's chief engineer took a dangerous shortcut, badgering a Vicksburg boilermaker into applying a temporary patch to the damaged boiler. In fact, they should replace the whole section of the boiler. But if they're going to do that, much time will be lost. Two vessels have sailed up river already. 1,300 on one of them, 700 on the other. And this is going, may be their last opportunity. While Sultana's boiler was being repaired, Captain Mason went ashore to collect his human cargo. The officer in charge of sending the thousands of men from Camp Fisk to the waiting steamboats at Vicksburg was Captain Frederick Speed. Upon filling out the rolls listing all soldiers, Speed would see to it they were shipped out in a timely fashion. And I don't think that Captain Frederick Speed knew what was going on. I don't think he took a bribe. They were bringing the men from Camp Fisk in by the train load, about 600 per load. Speed was there physically to load the first train load. Then he went off. Well, when Speed came back, another load had been put on, a second load, 
a train load, and he didn't really realize that. I don't know why someone didn't tell him, but then here came a third load, and Speed thought this was the second load. In addition to the paroled Union prisoners waiting to board Sultana at Vicksburg, there were 100 civilians with tickets for passage. Among them were 34-year-old Anne Annis, her husband, Lieutenant Harvey Annis, and their seven-year-old daughter, Belle. Anne had come to Vicksburg to care for her ailing husband and to accompany him back home to Wisconsin. She later recalled Sultana's overcrowded decks. Great fear was felt by everybody on account of the large number of passengers and the boat being top-heavy. The clerk pointed out to my husband and myself the sagging down of the hurricane deck in spite of extra stanchions which were put in a great many places. The boat was very much crowded, but the men behaved very well indeed. While the wooden support beams were posted under Sultana's deck, Mason stood on the wharf at Vicksburg, tabulating his profits, as a seemingly endless flow of gaunt, blue-clad troops boarded Sultana. Seeing the boat's sagging decks, the line of soldiers suddenly stopped. The few men with the strength to protest demanded to be transferred to the Pauline Carroll, a near-empty steamer docked at the wharf. To prevent the loss of valuable passengers, a loading officer concocted an outrageous story. The loading officer told them, you can't go on that boat because there's smallpox on board. And of course, that was what scared everybody in that day time and place. Pauline Carroll left with 17 passengers, and some of the passengers were remarking, isn't it a shame to load that many men on that boat? Private Isaac Van Nuys of the 57th Indiana Infantry was among the soldiers being hastily packed onto Sultana. When we were crowded on the vessel, I think it was six times its capacity. We were huddled together like sheep for the slaughter. Many as yet suffering from battle wounds, and most of them emaciated from starvation in prison pens. By the time Sultana was ready to depart Vicksburg, this 260-foot steamboat rated for 376 passengers bore the weight of approximately 2,500 persons, 120 tons of sugar, 90 cases of wine, 60 to 70 horses and mules, 100 hogs, and the crew's beloved mascot, a pet alligator who lived in a box behind one of the wheelhouses. In other words, here was a sultana, not quite as long as a football field. Here was the Titanic, the largest moving object in the world and one of the largest man-made objects in the Western world, and the Sultana had more people on it. Even the money-hungry Captain Mason began to worry as he surveyed the masses huddled upon Sultana's drooping decks. Almost when the boat was leaving, he expressed a concern that he had so many men on board that he would give anything, he would give his share of the Sultan if, if he could just get these men safely upriver. At 9 p.m., the Sultana pushed back from the wharf and steamed out onto the swift-flowing Mississippi River, bound for Cairo, Illinois. Among the 2,300 soldiers crammed into every imaginable space aboard Sultana's decks was Pam Newhouse's great-great-grandfather, 42-year-old Adam Schneider. Private Schneider and most of his fellow soldiers seemed oblivious to the discomforts of their cramped quarters. You know, they had been through such misery, though, before. Cahaba was bad, but Andersonville was uh, incredible. And so I think it just sort of passed over the top of their heads that this was not right. Private Chester D. Berry wrote of the boat's first day on the river. All went as gay as a marriage bell for a while. A happier lot of men, I think, I never saw than those poor fellows were. The prospect of soon reaching home made them content to endure any amount of crowding. The main thought that occupied every mind was home, the dearest spot on earth. On April 26th, Sultana stopped briefly at Helena, Arkansas. 
disaster nearly struck when a photographer on shore set up his camera in order to capture a picture of the overloaded vessel. In an effort to be seen in the photograph, most of the soldiers rushed to the port side of the boat, nearly causing it to capsize. But even though a lot of them were forced back to trim the boat on an even keel, that photograph, just every possible bit of space that uh, is horizontal has somebody standing there. The rails are just black with the soldiers in their dark uniforms. This remains the last photograph ever taken of the Sultana. After a last stop at Memphis, Sultana's overcrowded soldiers settled in for the night. Well, the officers were entitled to salon space, so rank having his privileges. The enlisted men were crammed out on the decks wherever they could. Some of them, who considered themselves lucky at the time, uh, managed to get up near the boilers and there they could keep reasonably warm. At 2 a.m., all was quiet on board Sultana as she steadily churned past a small group of islands known as Patty's Hen and Chickens. War-weary men slumbered peacefully, dreaming of homecomings and reunions. Just after 2 a.m., the silence was shattered by a blast that one witness described as more powerful than a hundred earthquakes. The midsection of Sultana exploded, sending a geyser of steam, wood, and bodies 50 feet into the nighttime sky. Those who weren't killed instantly crawled away from flames that had already engulfed the middle of the boat. April 27, 1865. Shortly after 2 a.m., the steamboat Sultana was rocked by a boiler explosion seven miles north of Memphis. The first explosion was immediately followed by two more blasts. Nearly 2,500 souls found themselves trapped between a blazing inferno and the raging floodwaters of the Mississippi River. Private Isaac Van Nuys later wrote of the chaos. The water was full of drowning men and dead bodies. I jumped into the river and went down. It seemed to me a half of a mile in the water. I managed to get two pieces of timber together by tying them with my suspenders around one end and nailing a board across the other end with a chunk of wood. When I had completed my little raft, I jumped astride it, pushed off from the burning boat, and floated down the stream. Back on board Sultana, the exploding boilers had ripped a gaping hole in the second deck, leaving it without any supporting structures. As a result, the deck caved in, funneling dozens of soldiers to their deaths in the coal-fed flames. Probably, if they'd organized fire brigades, they could have gotten that fire put out and it would not, the death rate wouldn't have been nearly uh, what it ended up being. But the problem there was there were just so many men and so many of the officers had been killed outright and so you just had panic. Up top, one of the Sultana's smokestacks collapsed onto the severely damaged hurricane deck causing it to crash down on top of hundreds of men. Many were killed instantly. Others managed to crawl through the twisted wreckage to parts of the deck that were still intact. Among those who witnessed this horrific scene was Chester D. Berry. I was awakened from a sound sleep by a stick of cordwood striking me on the head and fracturing my skull. I sprang to the bow of the boat, and turning, I looked back upon one of the most terrible scenes I ever beheld. The horrors of that night will never be effaced from my memory. Such swearing, praying, shouting, and crying. 
I had never heard. Like hundreds of others around him, Barry was faced with a mortal dilemma. To burn to death, or to jump overboard and risk drowning in the onrushing currents of the river that T.S. Eliot would call a strong brown god. Here is this river filled with this ice cold snow melt. It has risen way above its banks, way over the levees, has flooded the surrounding countryside and completely covered islands. And here are these men weakened by months in prison thrown into this ice cold water of a fast moving river. Another thing that happened though was there was so many men jumping off the boat that they were jumping down on top of each other. They would go into the, into the water like hundreds at a time and take each other down. So the panic just reigned. Those who survived relied on clear thinking and ingenuity, clinging to floating bits of wood, bales of hay, and in some cases, the bodies of dead mules and horses. With a stiff breeze fanning flames along the back half of Sultana and hopes of escape fading, Private William Luganbeel came up with a unique plan for survival. Every loose board, door, window, and shutter was taken to swim on, and the fire was getting very hot. I thought of the box that contained the alligator, so I got it out of the closet and took him out and ran the bayonet through him three times. Took off all my clothing except my drawers, drew the box to the end of the boat, threw it overboard, and jumped after. As William Luganbeel was impaling the unfortunate alligator, Anne Annis, her husband Harvey, and their young daughter Belle attempted an escape from the burning boat. My husband then put a life preserver upon me and one upon himself and took me and my child to the stern of the boat. And my husband and child jumped overboard. I followed as soon as I could. But the life preserver was not placed on me right, and I held on to the rudder till I was obliged to let go by the fire. Anne dropped into the freezing river, where she attempted to join her husband and daughter. Horrified, she could only watch as Harvey and Belle were swept away by the current, never to be seen again. In a state of shock, Anne clung tightly to a piece of wood and floated clear of the chaos before losing consciousness. Among those still perched aboard Sultana's stern was Captain J. Cass Mason. We know that Captain Mason survived the explosion because several soldiers saw him throwing shutters, debris, boards overboard so that the men could jump over and hold on to them. And then he's totally lost somehow. He certainly doesn't survive. Some 260 feet away, at the Sultana's bow, over 400 people, among the last still on board, huddled together in the hopes that they could avoid the inferno, until the hapless boat spun 180 degrees into a stiff breeze, fanning the flames toward the bow. With the fire creeping nearer, people were forced to jump into the sea of struggling passengers beneath them. Sultana was now abandoned. The anguished cries that had filled the Tennessee night slowly faded as Sultana began to burn herself out. Among those who escaped was Private James Stewart Cook of the 115th Ohio Infantry. He was among the first to be rescued from the icy Mississippi. I could not swim very much. The scenes of my life were passing through my mind and I was about to give up all hope when I saw downstream a dim light. This gave me new courage. As it approached me, I saw that it was a steamer. And as she neared me, I shouted with all the strength of a drowning man for help. Stewart was rescued by the Bostona II, a steamboat on her maiden voyage upon the Mississippi River. Upon sighting hundreds of drowning soldiers, the Bostona II's captain ordered all floatable items on his vessel thrown overboard. All told, the Bostona II rescued over 200 men. 
Seven miles away, the city of Memphis was alerted to the disaster by the distant glow of the burning Sultana and her survivors' cries for help. Every available boat headed for the site of the accident. The rescue fleet included several Union naval vessels. The gunboat Essex rescued William Luganbeel, still in his alligator's crate. At 9 a.m., with a final hiss of steam and water, Sultana disappeared beneath the murky floodwaters of the Mississippi, taking with her the remains of hundreds of unfortunate souls. By day's end, 786 survivors had been rescued and brought ashore. More than 200 of them would succumb to their injuries in the coming weeks, raising the death toll to more than 1,700 persons. What should have been a routine river transport was now the worst marine disaster in the history of the United States. April 27th, 1865. Overnight, the waterfront of Memphis was transformed into a makeshift morgue for victims of the Sultana disaster. One survivor reported a stretch of dead bodies four blocks long. Local hospitals were overrun with survivors. Among them was Private Chester Berry, who underwent surgery to repair his fractured skull. Following her release from a Memphis hospital, Anne Annis traveled from morgue to morgue, looking for her husband and daughter. She never found them. In the weeks following the disaster, the surviving soldiers once again boarded steamboats and headed north for Camp Chase, Ohio, where they were discharged from service. The last Sultana survivor left Memphis on June 7, 1865. The happiness of survivors' homecomings proved to be short-lived as they embarked upon the inexpedient task of seeking government restitution for their suffering. They tried for years to get a, a special pension because of this disaster and that it never came to pass in spite of the fact that they were willing to lay down their lives for this country. The government was not willing to stand up for them. And that was a bitter lesson, I think, uh, because so many of them were so, had been so patriotic. Private Chester D. Berry wrote of his attempts to obtain a survivor's pension. Two or three months afterward, my mother received official notice from Washington that her son was killed upon the Sultana. And my name stands today upon the Michigan Adjutant General's report for 1865 as killed by the explosion of the steamer Sultana. Yet, when in after years, I applied for a pension for that fractured skull, I was obliged to prove that I was upon the Sultana. As important to the men as their pensions was the government's recognition of the enormity of the disaster. In 1885, the men formed the Sultana Survivors Association. They will band together, have reunions, try to get a monetary award, but none of them get any more than any other Union soldier with no disability, $8 a month. They will try to get a government monument, such grace many of the great battlefields of the Civil War, or the, even the prison camps of the Civil War. They do not. Led by John H. Simpson, a former private with the 3rd Tennessee Cavalry, one Southern survivors group took matters into their own hands and erected their own monument in Mount Olive Cemetery in Knoxville on July 4th, 1912. As the years passed, the size of the reunions dwindled. 
the last living survivor of the Sultana, 96-year-old Elkanah Millard of the 3rd Tennessee Cavalry, died on March 3rd, 1937. Though all the survivors of the Sultana disaster were now gone, their tales of sorrow and loss lived on through their families. The misery never ended for these poor Civil War guys. Not only on the battlefield, but then they had to go through a horrible time in prison. You might wonder, even the ones that survived the Sultana, were they really all right? I mean, were they mentally all right? And the fact of the matter is that many of them weren't all right. Michael Conrad was one who was never able to put this behind him because on the anniversary of the sinking, on April 27th of every year, he would come to my grandmother's house and he would, they said he would cry like a baby. Just cry, cry like a baby is how it was put. The heartbroken survivor's grief would soon turn to outrage upon hearing the shocking results of the government's investigations into the disaster. In the days following the explosion of the Sultana on April 27, 1865, the United States government launched its investigation. The points raised are who was responsible for picking Sultana. Who was responsible for putting the prisoners of that great um, number aboard Sultana, and how many were they? The government pursued three separate investigations, and ultimately, court-martial charges were placed against Captain Frederick Speed, the exchange officer who had miscounted the number of men at Camp Fisk. Speed was initially convicted, but his court-martial was later overturned. No one else was ever tried for the disaster. Among the Union officers avoiding prosecution was the corrupt quartermaster, Colonel Reuben Hatch, who had arranged for the soldiers to travel aboard Sultana. So, in the end, nobody was punished for this, or nobody, nobody was held accountable, let's put it that way. I think that's, that's the crime, that, you know, no one was held accountable for this. There were some in the nation who were outraged when the Army wrapped up its investigations in 1866. The Chicago Tribune commented, this report reads very much like a studied attempt to conceal the guilty and whitewash those who crowded 2,400 souls on a boat that ought not to have received one-fourth of that number. The government whitewash of the disaster even extended to Sultana's crew members. The engineer who had coerced the boilermaker in Vicksburg to apply the temporary patch was never charged. Instead, the blame was placed with the second engineer, who died as a result of burns he had suffered in the blast. By the summer of 1865, the Sultana tragedy had faded from the American consciousness. The nation was consumed by the daunting task of reconstruction. The public was jaded and indifferent to death. They had just come through a four-year war. Over 600,000 soldiers had died. To most people in the United States, the Sultana was just another casualty list. It disappears very fast from the press, particularly the Eastern press. And unfortunately, this terrible destruction, the transport to disaster, is soon forgotten. Despite the short memory of the American public, the Sultana disaster did result in a few far-reaching changes to the steamboat industry. 
In 1866, two safety-minded physicists founded the Hartford Steam Boiler Inspection and Insurance Company. In that same year, most tubular boilers, like those that exploded on board the Sultana, were replaced by safer models. And never again was a boat so recklessly overloaded. Although it's been over 130 years since the Sultana explosion ended the lives of over 1,700 souls, her legacy continues to grow. Today, the torch is carried by historians as well as descendants of the men and women aboard the ill-fated steamship. Pam Newhouse's great-great-grandfather, Adam Schneider, died on the Sultana. My great-great-grandmother never remarried, so she kept his memory alive and burnished his memory all those years. And that's sort of what I am trying to do, too, not just for my great-great-grandfather, but for all these men. I figure that as long as one person remembers, then they'll never be forgotten, and that's important. Though Sultana now lies buried under the soil of an Arkansas soybean field, the lessons of her demise are timeless and universal. Human avarice and arrogance are often close companions of disaster. Whenever we go, in search of history.